I'm the MMA king and I came for the crown All your phonies and clowns need to move around Cause I'ma put you in the dirt and have you come out looking brown But it's okay, don't frown, cause I'm always gonna be around So listen up, I'm only getting started, this is still the first round Hello MMA fans, YouTubers, my followers And everybody who's gonna be celebrating uh, this episode, this uh, channel's and the Fighting Guru's uh, milestone. I want to tell you guys uh, congratulations with me. We've reached a hurdle. We've gotten to a place I never thought we would have gotten to so quickly. I obviously had concerns if I ever would even make it to this point. Everybody, you know, always worries. I mean, I'm a confident person, so don't get me wrong. I didn't have low expectations. I knew what I'm capable of. I knew what I'm worth, and I know the skill sets I have are invaluable. It's a, not just something you can teach. It's a skill you got to have natural, uh, as well as something that you have to teach. It's a combination. So the fact that we've got here after only two or three months is just a ma nothing short of a just such a, a miracle. It's it's got to be from a mixture between just great. Uh, luck, good luck, you know, blessed from God and just all you people here following because I can finally now do this full time and have officially that job I've always spoken to you guys about, which I can get into more specifics about now comfortably. I don't have to do it anymore. I won't have to do it. I, I did it the professional way. I didn't want to just stop working there, even though I kind of could have a little bit sooner. Uh, I, out of professionalism, I, I stayed there for longer just to give them the time uh, and the notice that was required to be professional and leave on good terms, which is the right way you should do any type of uh, uh, transition from one company to another or a job to another. You should always leave on good terms for more than one reason. But anyways, we're not, we're not going to get on, and on that. This is not what this show is about. So thank you first and foremost, this is day one, congratulations, we're going to make some improvements overnight. You're going to see just the foundation, the, the show's output, I mean layout, the the visualizations, the uh, sophistication, just everything that you see is going to be much better and the quality of the content is better. So congratulations to the patrons who made it with me. 90% accuracy was not going to cut it. I need 100%. So from now on, here's my guarantee to everybody not just watching the channel because I only give out a specific amount of content for a reason. It was nothing to do with the time, so that will still stay the same. I'm never going to do full card breakdowns, but the breakdowns that I do on this channel are going to be breakdowns that are for sure going to be coming to fruition. For to, to, so it's a guaranteed uh, uh, prediction that unless something weird freak accidents like it's never going to be a straight wrong answer where somebody did something and like one guy outclassed the other guy instead of the other those will not happen on this channel I give you my word or else I'm not who I am I'm not who I say I am and I don't do what I say I do so that's not going to happen I mean but of course with the exceptional like rules of robberies or uh, just like one lucky punch so we're like somebody will be losing the entire fight like 10 8 rounds and then get caught with a punch that's something different but you guys would have seen that the person I, I chose was the guy who was winning the majority of the fight and nine out of ten times would have won the fight so except for those of course because th that's inevitable it's a part of the fight game if it wasn't there would be no need for referees and judges and betting. Everybody would know who would win and there would be no other second alternative option. So it would be pointless, right? Anyway, back on track. All right, so the other thing we're going to do is I'm going to touch on a little bit. Uh, it's going to be more organized. Every episode is going to have a layout. So the first fight, and it's going to be consistent. So you'll know without even needing timestamps, you'll know how long the episode is supposed to be a 30 minute episode, of, depending on which segment is this going to be the fate of the week? Is it going to be the parlays episode? So some of them may be longer, but you'll know which ones they are, which ones to skip towards. We'll do more than one a week. And there'll still be timestamps. And it'll be organized. So I'm going to give you a table of contents. First, we're going to start with the underdog. 
The second topic will be the parlay piece. Every episode, I'm going to give you one of each. Then we're going to talk about the my fate of the week, the guy you can lay the most chalk against, who you should not be able to expect to win even one out of ten times. It, it would not even be able to be given a puncher's chance. You know, but with the exception of like robberies, they would have no chance. And then we're going to do like a prop bet and method or victory or round something like a special prop. Uh, and then we'll like, if there's enough time still left, I'll designate it to like breaking news or MMA topic, hot topics and interesting stuff that's current affairs in MMA. And I'll give you some opinions and my opinions about it and what it means uh, to the hardcores and the guys who know the political reasons behind most of the stuff that's going on and or what the outcome of it could lead to. So that's a perspective you get that's invaluable. And then I'll give you the most important thing is the betting tips, the stuff that most people pay me to do. If you look, the way we got here is I got about a hundred, I'm doubling almost every month. Every month I'm doubling my patrons and they're staying long term. Like if I show you my cancellations, I have less than a handful, less than five people in the last 30 days, and I've grown uh, up to a hundred. So out of a hundred people, less than five people have canceled or deleted. Even if we didn't have our best weeks, they knew the value of being in the Patreon was far greater than what they even signed up for. Let me give you an example, okay? Here's what you cannot learn. What I'm gonna give you today is a underdog, right? Now this underdog, I'm going to give you most people not only would they have not seen them, but they would be so as they would not understand that they're supposed to win and they should be the favorite. But like Joseph Nathan Manez, he was an underdog, almost three to one underdog, right? But he was my biggest parlay piece. He was in 80% of my parlays, right? Here's an example. Uh, Michael Chiesa, if you look at my, ask my patrons or I'll, I'll open up just that one post for everybody to see the timestamps. I actually have it on my Twitter. You can see the date and time I posted it. There was a reason why Umar Nurmagomedov, the most biggest favorite of the night, everybody's most sure pick. I even, his opponent was my fate of the week. So you know that I personally, if nobody else Let's forget about the odd makers who made him the biggest favorite. Forget about his like undefeated, uh, pretty much pre the best fighter on the card almost, you know. But forgetting all that, do you know he was my on my list? I only I'm very selective about who I'm the parlay king, so I focus a lot of attention and money on parlays when I'm doing my own personal bet slips because I know how to do parlays. Where for most people it would be risky, but for me it's actually safe and profitable. But my single bets are the best part about my Patreon and the best part of why you're watching this show. The way I can tell you who's the most valuable, which will be a part of the segment. Every segment we're going to give you one valuable, great single bet play. And if you look, it wasn't Umar. Most people's would have been Umar because he's the most confident, right? But my first, Umar was my last pick. He was on the list of 10 single bets that I made for that week. He was number 10. Let me remind you, uh, nine out of 10 of those hit. Only one of them did not hit. So just for that, if you if you want to join my Patreon, just, and I don't, I have a rule. I don't bet them unless they're either guaranteed to win or there's one, two real. They have to be guaranteed to win or they have to have great value. So if it's not a minus one, if it's anything more than minus 200, more than two to one favorite, I will not bet it unless it's guaranteed to win. So like a fade of the week. That's why he even made it to the number 10. Most of the time, a minus 500 favorite will not even make it on my single bets list. This is a list that I'm instructing my Patreon members to make a play on them. So you're making a single bet play on only these people, if you bet on anybody else as a single bet, then you're not following instructions and we are uh, not, I am not responsible for losing money. But if you want to win money, you'll never lose money if you just follow my instructions, okay? One of my instructions is before making parlays, you have to make these single bets. Sometimes the single bets list will only have four bets. Sometimes it'll have 14 bets. Let me tell you, go back to my Twitter 
and look at the timestamps or go back to my Patreon if you're in my Patreon and look at the stamps on my single bet plays for last event, Michael Chiesa event, for example, that event, I made 10. Number 10 was Umar Namurmagedov, but number one was Michael Chiesa. He was an underdog. So my best play of the day was an underdog because I knew what I told, I did a two paragraph, I'm sorry, two page explanation post in my, just the same way I did for Joaquin Buckley, but that I gave as a freebie on Twitter. If you look at my Twitter, a week before Buckley got knocked out, I put a post saying, hey, this is a heads up to everybody in M I hashtag MMA Twitter. So nobody, I said, you guys are all going to have the wool pulled over your eyes. He's going to be a parlay runer. And I explained, I don't just tell you, don't do this and do this and good luck. I give you, so you can be comfortable, a two page story explanation behind a million reasons. And if there aren't a million reasons, then you probably do have a good chance and you have a good reason to want to bet on him. But there is a reason why he was in zero of my uh, single bets. I had no single bets on him and he was not in my single bets list and he was not in my column A important parlay pieces. And that's why the system works beautifully. I knew what I needed to do. So here's what I was saying about Chiesa. He won unanimously 10-8 rounds. It wasn't close. Nobody can say it was a fluke. Nobody can say it was a robbery. Nobody can say 8 out of 10. It was 9 or 10 out of 10 times going to always be Chiesa. And I listed several reasons. Not one, not two, not three. Several reasons why. And now because he's an underdog, not minus 600 like Umar, because they're both for sure going to win. I know that they're both, but why would I go with the guy who they say is the safest one on the night? When To me, I don't care if the opponent is good or bad. Or if a win is a win is a win. If he's going to win, he's going to win. Whether he battled through adversity, whether it was going to be just barely, a win is a win. And I know you're going to get the win. So why would I want to make a guy who's a minus 600 be a more comfortable parlay piece? So I've... Mastered the system where how many times I tell you sometimes the best parlays are the guys who are either underdogs or slight favorites and the worst ones are the Koskis, the minus 700s, the minus 600s. So um, I've developed another thing that this is just part one. There's a million things that make my Patreon special and why it, people will never quit it. Um, I can turn a minus, now, like now let's say I got a Chiesa, right? I know Magni is not going to get submitted. I know Magni, you can stay on the ground with Magni for seven hours a day, seven days a week, and you're not going to submit him, but you'll keep him on the ground because you're more powerful than him if you're Chiesa. So I knew 100% sure it was going to go to the decisions. Unless he got a knockout, which I don't think because he is durable. He's young. He, he doesn't have mileage. He hasn't been knocked out 17 times. He's young. He's new. He, had, he, he still has treads on his tires. His chin is not uh, faded. So I knew it was going to decision 9 out of 10 times. So now we took not only a guy who's an underdog, but we took an underdog and found the specific method to how he's going to win. And that's why I said the over rounds. Look at my post, the timestamp. Before the fight started, I even mentioned it minutes. Just in case anybody forgot, didn't pay attention to the long page explanations throughout the entire week. I, I reposted different versions and more and more depth v reasons. And every folder, you'll see every fighter coming up has a folder, individual folder for themselves and for their fight, where I'll say advantages, disadvantages, uh, areas that'll make the difference. So I'm going to do the same thing on this episode and every episode, but it's just one out of 12. You're only going to get one piece out of 14 pieces where I'm going to do what I do for the patrons for every fight. And I'll do it for different categories. But anyways, Chiesa, and guess who number two was? Matt Danger Schnell. And guess how we knew he was going to win? I said 90, I marked my words, I screenshotted it at the time. I said 99.99% sure he will not get knocked out. And if he wins, it'll be by decision. So, and I knew he was going to win. He was my number two. So now let's focus. Now, do you know if you're making these types of plays, as long as they're not all favorites, 
that are minus five hundreds, which I told you I don't do, even if you only get half of your picks correct, let's say my accuracy was not 90% like you guys see it is around. If I get half right, I'm still gonna be in the profits because these guys are paying plus money. I'm finding first shift Chenko minus 1800, I got you plus 275. What do you think I'm doing with these minus 100s? I'm getting you good, good plus money, not just plus money. So if I even only had half of my accuracies right instead of what I really do get, I would be in the profits. That's why you can afford to make parlays. Do you know just one of my column C parlays? Remember, A and B are my most highly percentages in profits and or hitting. I hit the most in parlays in A and B. My column C last week in the Chiesa one, I had a six leg parlay. Chiesa, Ike Villanueva, who was a very slight favorite, tiny favorite. It was almost pick'em. So Brad Tavares became a pick'em's. It was like minus 115 to minus 115. Brad Tavares, Ike Villanueva, and Matt Schnell as an underdog, Chiesa as an underdog, and like a girl who opened up as an underdog, Minot Ferrio. Look at the parlay I put. Six leg parlay. I cashed that, that one by itself made me all my money back and profit. Now, everything else, the single bets, the prop bets, the other parlays, which I hit penny, was profits. All my money was already made back with that one parlay. So you're telling me that the patrons are not gonna, if we even have a bad day, you tell with things, how about the Hermanson card? 40 out of 47, if you only bet $10, on each of my parlays, right? Because you can bet $1, $5, $10, or $1,000, but it'll just go with $10. If you bet $10 on my parlays, that included the full parlay slips I give you once a week, you would have won off of $10 only, all your money back, plus $1,900 in profits. Profits of $1,900 plus your money back which would have came out to about $2,400, $2,500 in total tickets to cash out. So, all right guys, I don't have to keep explaining that part. This is just to let you know what you're getting in the Patreon, reasons why people are growing by the numbers and why I'm doing this full time. I wanna thank you for everybody who's there, who stays there, who's not. I have some people that I had to kick out and they came back under different names. That's how valuable this place is, okay? So, and I, like they, they get mad like, it's not my fault if somebody shows bad IQ. All I can do is research and tell you what's supposed to happen. Now, if it doesn't happen like it's supposed to, I, I'm not the one who was in the fight. I, you should be mad at the people in the ring. Did I tell the guy who was supposed to keep kicking and using his leg kicks that were showing him success? Did I tell him, go now, stop using your leg kicks, keep your hands down, and go get punched in the face instead of you know trying to win? I mean, I can who can predict that, you know? And people get mad and they try to be disrespectful. I'm not gonna put up with it. So that's the only reasons I have to kick people out. Other than that, my my numbers would be in the over 100 range, but w congratulations, we've hit 100. And uh, it's only been two months in, so I now I'm able to finally give you guys the accuracy, the quality of the content, especially in the Patreon. You're gonna see profits in the range of, you won't even believe it, my bet slips are gonna look better than they've ever looked. Um, my single bet values, my prop bets, my parlays, everything is gonna be a million times better, including the YouTube videos. You're gonna to start to notice it from day one. The episodes are gonna be looking better than ever. All right, guys, let's focus on the underdog. And I'm sorry, the introduction, this, this won't happen again. This is a one time only just telling you we've reached a milestone. So if you notice any differences or what you can expect to see from that one, there's a reason I'm doing it full time. Thanks to all you guys. All right, back on track. My underdog of the day. All right, this guy has no business being an underdog, and let me explain to you why. All right, this uh, guy, I'm, I'm, you know, actually, funny thing is, he wasn't an underdog. So that's how you know it screams value. When there's a guy, perfect example, Joseph Nathan Manez. He was a huge favorite over Luke, uh, whatever his name is, Luke something. And he eventually, before the fight got uh, started, 
he had turned into a, he went from two to one favorite to three to one underdog almost. So I had to keep re-betting him later. And this happened with Darush too. Benil Darush, sometimes this happens. He opens up as a big favorite and now look at him, he's an underdog. So this happens and that's why if you remember the last time I bet on Benil Darush, I put about $1,800 on him, but it was in increments like 400, 400, 600, 300 as the lines. And that's another perk of the Patreon. I make live notifications every time somebody's lines are moving in a direction that's in our favor or quite the opposite. If I start to notice like, uh oh, it's going in the opposite direction. You guys got to move fast. I did that for somebody today. I forgot who, which fighter it was, but I did it for both. Uh, I think it was Michael Johnson for Clay Guida. I can't remember, but I'll do it for both. I'll tell you guys, look, this guy's moving fast. So anybody who wants to put more money, this is the time to do it. Or anybody who was intending on putting more money on him, wait until fight night or until further notice because the money is going in the opposite and on our favor. So you don't want to bet on it now. You want to bet on it when it's when he's a bigger underdog or less of a favorite. So another money making uh, privilege and perk of the club. All right, uh, so who will we talk? Oh yeah, so a guy who's an underdog right now who should have been a favorite and was a favorite until the casuals and just the guys who don't know what they're doing got their hands on the bets. So I'm so sorry because my names, if there's anything I'm not good at when it comes to MMA is names. So that's where I need some help. And my name lady, unfortunately, had the day off today, so we won't be able to get any help from her. And I apologize about that. Okay, so, but I'll, I'll get to it. One second, guys. Thank you for your patience. All right, uh, so, okay, here we go. My first underdog play of the day. Colin Anglin. All in, let's speak about, and this is an, another new thing I'm going to do. Forgetting, we cannot just focus on the fighters that we like. I like Colin Anglin, but I got to make sure before I decide to parlay him, before I, remember, when I when I know a guy's going to win, to me, all my picks are parlay. There's a, that's why my system, people laugh like, oh, you have so many parlays there. Why are you putting these guys? If you know he's going to win, you know he's going to win. He's a parlay piece, that's it. So all my picks are pretty much parlay pieces unless I tell you it's a guy that you may have to hedge off of or it's a guy you gotta be careful for this reason or that reason, that's different. So like circumstances sometimes will make them not parlay pieces and only for single bets, but for the majority of the part, all my picks more often, like 80% of the time are parlay pieces because I when I know I'm right, when I know Somebody's gonna win. You, when you know, when you know something, you know something. It, it, you, there's no questions. I, I don't take guesses, or, and I don't hope for things. I have two-page valid explanations for them. So why wouldn't it be a parlay piece? So here's another guy who I, I would be comfortable parlaying. Uh, there's just levels to it. I told you in the last seg segment. I'm gonna start breaking it down to make it simplified into like if MMA was a art of its own. Black belts and blue belts and purple belts and white belts. Well, uh, Colin Anglin is a high level brown belt, we'll say, okay? This guy's got good technique. He's got like uh, cardio for days. This guy's cardio is freakish. And here's good, here's the best thing about it is his IQ. He does something that you'll notice that got even Dustin Poirier the win over Conor McGregor probably, but also in most of his fights, it got him to win in his Hooker fight. When Dustin fought Hooker and when Dustin fought Justin Gaethje, you'll see he does this in every one of his fights. And that's why if you go to 36 minutes, if you go back to the episode, also my posts in my Patreon, you'll see that I told you guys the live bet, but forget it, forget the posts because that was the same day. So it may, you may have missed it unless you were in the Patreon, but if you go back to 36 minutes and 36 seconds, so 36, 36, if two segments, the segments where I was wearing a black hoodie pullover with the, the crown, it says King. So my Parley King uh, black sweater hoodie. If you go to that episode, like two or three episodes ago, 36 minutes and 36 seconds into it, I was saying you have to, if you're smart, you'll wait until after the first round 
if Connor did not knock out Dustin. That Dustin is a slow starter. Connor's quite the opposite. My exact words were he's gonna come out like a bat out of hell. Dustin takes a couple of minutes to gauge this, so by the time he opens up and he's comfortable, and uh, as well as his strategy, he does it. And this is why they do it. There's two or three reasons why. Let me explain. I'm a fighter. I understand. I do this. I used to do this myself. I've watched people do it, and I've given people the advice to do it. So this is what you should. This is what Dustin does, and this is what Aust uh, This is what Colin England does. Uh, and a lot of even professional race car drivers do it in a different concept where you gotta you let go of the gas just enough so you're let, you're giving your opponent a sense of that he thinks you're giving the hundred your best um, efforts he thinks that you're giving your full effort you're going at the full pace that you're able to and you're matching him so usually if you're the guy, because a guy like uh, Dustin Poirier and a guy like this, they have unlimited. Remember I told you when I was a young fighter, you can wake me up at 5 in the morning, I'll run 30 miles. And I, I got to the point when I was doing the stairs where I would never run out of breath. I wouldn't even sweat. But when I started at the gym, I was, I could only do like 10 sets and I would be, my kidneys would, my sides would be hurting. I'd be sweating. But then after doing it for so long, it becomes, you get unlimited cardio They've reached that level. Amanda Nunes is, and they've reached uh, Holly Holmes. They've reached that level of unlimited cardio because they know how to breathe. It's a part of their system, and their uh, body is accustomed and trained and used to doing it. So, what they do now is they have a way to manipulate and use it towards their advantage. So, what Dustin does is he'll let off the pedal, but it, he, his opponents will not know that. So, they'll be at full pedal and then later in the second round third round whenever they see their opponent starting to fade away they'll start to increase so let me tell you what this does now they'll go push the pace they'll go from 80 percent to 90 which means more output more quickness on the feet more maneuvers more volume more everything aggression so now what you're doing is not only are you looking better in the scorecards the judges are like wow look at the difference between this guy and this guy and that holds a lot of weight on the scorecards especially in the later rounds we've seen that the later rounds can mean more in the judges eyes many times over the beginning rounds but not only is that one thing but number two is the psych the mental aspect of the warfare you're telling your opponent like hey dude you can't keep up with me you're going to lose. That messes up with their confidence. They're, they start to get scared. They start to worry, panic. And anytime you got those kind of emotions, especially those emotions, or any emotions, but those emotions especially, you've already lost the fight. If you're concerned about not being able to keep up with somebody and you see that they're getting better and you know that you're getting worse, it's almost like the father time theory. When the, the Why the reasons you know, Robbie Lawler and Tyrone Woodley of the sport are gun shy and Ben Askren's they, they're afraid they don't engage like they used to is because they know that they can get into trouble or that they're beat that the punches don't have as much behind them that they're not as durable enough to be able to take those the the miles on their treads on their tires their chins they don't hold up the same so they get scared and, and concerned and worried about engaging in those uh exchanges so that's what happens in the middle of the fight, believe it or not. And we saw it. Remember, I made the post when I, you know, when I noticed something, even Dustin said it himself. After he was kicking Connor, those calf kicks, and as, when Connor, okay, when Connor tried to catch his kicks, especially more than once, right there, I made the post. I knew the fight was over. And then to on top the confirmation after, and I'll explain to you guys why, because a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? Everybody catches that. There's a lot of science does it. Let me explain to you the difference, okay? And the other confirmation was head hunting. After that, you saw he wasn't setting up combinations. He wasn't throwing jabs. He started desperately going for his famous left hook. That would knock out punch because he knew if he doesn't knock him out right now, he was about to go down. He knew it. I saw it. He saw it. He knew it. Dustin knew it. Everybody knew it. It was over. It was just a matter. He actually he kept backed up. He got back there. He didn't even bother punching. Do you notice? He stopped punching after a while. And he was just waiting for the inevitable. He he knew it. What was going to happen? So, but let me explain to you why the leg kick 
was the first thing that sold me on he was and I made a post so anybody would have figured it out but I if you go back to my video I told you guys in, in 36 minutes and 36 seconds like a, two, a week or two before uh, the fights even came on uh, that to bet on poor year in the second rounds for the, more than one reason I'll explain the poor year if you look back on when he was a kid I, if, you, if you show me two guys okay this is a fight mind when you have a fight mind you're a fighter you've trained especially you show me two kids. When Dustin Poirier was a fat, big-boned kid when he was little. He was a big kid. He was, he was chubby. He was, had a lot of meat on him. He was a big boy. That big boy strength, even in the later years, it, you, Connor was a skinny kid. He's not big. He, he's the, if you want to be big in the size of a, in the style, type of a body that Connor has, you have to eat a lot and you have to work out. D Dustin just is naturally that guy he doesn't have to do it so the more thicker the more stronger naturally and then don't don't forget that now they're exercising they're at the level of their stage or their profession they have professional uh, strength coaches so if you do for example if connor and dustin do a hundred push-ups a day for five hours a day they do the exact same workouts for the exact duration of the time doing the same thing eating the same thing the stronger guy will be Dustin. He's more built for that. You can tell it from just the body types from since they were kids. That if Dustin, if Dustin wants to win the fight, all he's got to do is just punch. He's going to be more durable. Where Connor's got to be the more fluid. He's got to use footwork. He's got to do like what Israel Adesanya does in his fights against Paulo Costa, against Yoel Romero. He's got to be the one cutting angles, not the one forward pressure. On Connor is used to being for pressure. That's how he won the first time against Poirier, and he thought he could do it again. Nope. This time Connor was the Poirier. He was the guy on the. He should have been getting backed up. The bully was supposed to be getting bullied, but he got the message too late. The memo. He didn't get it, and it was too late. So when he started catching leg kicks, how how many times do you? If, if you're a fighter, let me ask you this, or if you or if you know a fighter, go ask them this. How many times does your coach train with you catch leg kicks? There's a problem. When you, when you have to catch a leg kick to block it, number one, you're bad IQ, you have bad IQ. Number two, you have bad technique. There's way better ways. When you have to catch a leg kick, that means two things. Number one, it's already done its damage because you can't catch it before or unless you're going to try to break your wrist or your fingers because the hardest weapon, the strong... Why do you think Munir Laziz lost the hardest weapon is your kicks warley alvis used a hundred times more stronger velocity than a punch is your kicks so a kick you don't stop it by catching it and that's the one number two and now your hands are not free how are you gonna block how are you gonna punch it's so for so many reasons i can keep going it's a bad number. It already landed. And even Dustin said in the prophet, he was catching it after they already landed. So that's when I knew he was desperate. He was showing a bad IQ. He didn't know what he was doing. And he was actually hurting himself more. by catch he, he was better off not catching it. And so it's, it wasn't a surprise that seconds after I recognized that, he got knocked out because he was doing other things at the same time. It wasn't just that mistake. But that's why I'm going to start doing live companions. If you guys ever join me in a live companion and you have your hands, the, your finger on the button of like hedge, wherever, you guys will be millionaires. I, I assure you that now. So join the Patreon. I'm going to start doing private segments just for their companions and notifications. If you ask my Patreon, just for that reason alone, the notifications that go instantly to your email, your ding, ding, during the fights, you'll get a million ding, ding bells that are ringing during the fights live. For those alone, you got your membership back and it's worth it. So I did it, how many times a guy was on the floor getting beat up to losing the round 10, eight rounds. And I told you like a Lewis Smoker, he's a slow starter or a uh, J Charles Jordan is a slow starter. Martin Vittori is like a, a lot of times I told you guys and, and it, came, it became beneficial for you if you listen to me at the moments. We did it in the Bellator fight. All right, so my underdog Colin Anglin, this is a guy who's on a seven fight win streak. He's an underdog because of the casuals, okay? Let's focus on his opponent. Now, let me tell you, his opponent's got some of the worst IQ ever. If, you, if you're if you in the Patreon and you saw a post, 
the post would say advantages IQ. Anytime you see IQ as an advantage, unless the other guy at a disadvantage of the IQ has some crazy knockout power, that's the key. If I had to put a star next to any advantages, it's IQ. IQ alone is one of the most important parts of any fight. If we were, we were doing an interview yesterday with a UFC future star, she'll be a champion, mark my words one day. Miranda Maverick agreed with me yesterday saying that IQ is one of the most important. By the way, if you missed an interview, you should check it out. You're gonna get so much insight, invaluable, not just about future stuff like movies that are coming out for that have UFC fighters in them and a lot of cool stuff. Fighting, just if you're a fighting fan, not even anything to do with gambling, but also gambling because she's got a fight coming up in about three or four weeks on February 13th. She's got a bad fight, dude. A bad, I don't want to swear, a, a super cool fight, man. Coming up against uh, Jillian Robertson, and she's given us some insight about what she's going to do. So if you like prop bets, you like parlay pieces, the last time I bet on, go look at my Twitter account. It was the October 20, week of October 24th. Go back to my October posts. I posted it before the event started off of the tickets that Miranda Maverick by herself cashed in. I made in profits off of Miranda Maverick's tickets alone, over $7,000 in profits. $7,000 on her debut fight. Mind you, this was her debut fight against Lillian Georgia, a Georgian. Remember how Georgians have been doing? The Gurams, the Giga Chikese. I had so much insight off of a one i had so much confidence mind you georgia not just she's georgian and georgians have been doing well she had been coming in like i at that moment she had won five out of her last six she had most of she had about five finishes in the first round her arm bars were from like guard she can pull guard and get an arm bar and from her back and feel like she's shown so much durability, toughness, and good technique, she still opened up as an underdog. And I knew after tape studies and just finding out the details that I found out about Miranda Maverick, how she grew up with fighting, you know, in her blood. She used to work out on a farm when she was a kid, and that's why you see her muscles are very toned and very def defined. And her strength advantage, that's why she beat girls like Victoria Leonardo, who's just known for her strength, that wins fights based off her just being the tougher girl. If you remember, that's how I broke down Victoria Leonardo's description. If you remember the video when she, she was being broken down about her fight with Manon, the French girl who we parlayed, and opened as an underdog, and we got her early, and she became a favorite eventually, but we won money off of her beating Victoria Leonardo. Well, she beat Victoria Leonardo twice, way before she was even in the UFC. And she beat Pearl Gonzalez in a pretty impressive fashion, way before she was in the UFC. And mind you, she's only 23 years old. So if you want insight, go look at the interview yesterday. She talked a lot about how she's gonna win, what she's got in store for Jillian, and where, if it goes, Jillian likes to go in take people to the ground and do ground and pound and try to submit. She, she tells us about what her answers would be if that were to come, uh, if that were to be, to come, come to fruition and she, and she implements that game plan against her, what she'll do. And so that'll help you guys make your decisions if you're not in my Patreon and you're not just gonna duplicate my bet slips and follow me on what I'm gonna do. At least you'll have insight on what you think you should do based off of what the fighters are saying. So from now, I'm just going to, I'm focusing on like bringing fighters who have upcoming fights and who I really am high on. People that are making us money, who have already made us money, especially like the last guy before, uh, the last fighter before her, we had made a lot of money. If you remember, I told you guys he was the biggest parlay piece of our night. So that, that's going to be the trend you're going to notice. All right, so under like uh, I noticed about uh, this guy's opponent, um, what's his name? Yu Wu Chen. Ah, oh, I'm not even gonna try. I, have to, I wrote it down. Sorry, one second. So we're running the uh, uh, Su Wu Choi. He's got an eight and three record. 
Uh, three of them by first round finishes, but that was way back in like 2017 was the last time that that happened. And that was like, um, it, it was uh, a guy, you guys, I don't know if you've heard of him. I, I remember this guy. He's not that good. Uh, young boy, funny name, young boy kill. And so the last time he had knocked anybody out was in 2007. The guy's name is young boy kill, but that was his retirement fight it was the last time he was ever even in the octagon he was on his way out the door and before that it was like 2016 another guy who's got like a losing record and then before that was like 2015 so recently it's not about what you did in in your career it's about what you've done mma is you'll notice it's a very un, unfriendly sport for when it comes to uh father time it catches up to people faster than any other sport unlike boxing where you could be like a bernard hopkins or a george foreman or a tyson because they're pillow fists i mean they give you padding that's 10 times more cushion on your gloves they also limit to the you can't use the sharp elbows and the knees and submissions and break bones so your longevity is a lot better and your likelihood of retiring at a later age is more feasible so but unlike that in mma your dog years so it's a much different thing so for uh it's more about what you've done for me lately and lately Wu Choi has not been looking the greatest uh i mean don't get me wrong he was kind of given the short end of the stick twice because first debut fight they gave him Masvar Evalov guys we know who Masvar 14 and 0 undefeated the Khabib the dark horse of the division this guy's serious future contender. This guy's got to be future champion one day. I mean, his his output, his strength, his just well-roundedness on the feet. He, I love the way he mixes it up. From well, I could talk for days about it. And he just made us a killing. So I could talk about it. Let's focus. Let's be disciplined on the show. I don't want to go sidetrack because I'm an MMA. I'm a true MMA fan, guys. I've been watching MMA since the Hoist Gracie days. I know I was watching it live on the first UFC one that ever aired. And since then I've been watching it live. So I can sidetrack about everything, anything you can think of. I'll, I'll, ta I'll talk to you about it for days, but we gotta be disciplined. We're gonna go back on Sung Wu Choi. Eight and three, he's only got one win recently and it was, a, it was against uh, a guy who was on a three fight losing streak. So, because after his loss to Evolov, he got Gavin Tucker, but you know when he got Gavin Tucker, and I'm high on Gavin Tucker too, so that's another short end of the stick uh, opponent. So I don't know if they don't like this guy or they just know, you'll notice when they see a guy, doesn't mean that they don't like him necessarily, but if they don't see a future in him, he's not going to be some top 10 like a Pedro Munoz. Like for example, they don't mind putting them into like situations where they're setting them up for failure inevitably or rob them from decisions and for the greater cause because of a bigger name like edgar who can move up and sell pay-per-views or or get more you know uh fans attention so like you'll notice those guys that they don't care about they'll put them as sacrifice the sacrificial goats lambs i mean sacrificial lambs because <clears throat> what's gonna uh What's going to end up happening is, sorry for the delay, what's going to end up happening is they're going to give, uh, right now, this is a, not just because the guy's just more well-rounded, Su Wong Choi is very weak. He's got decent cardio. He's He's got a very bad stance for MMA. MMA, he, it, the way it's evolved, like the new tech, the new, uh, like, the new breed the new evolution of what mma fighters have become now is the reason why guys like lawler and woodley are obsolete is they're becoming obsolete is because unless you're like the best at it the style of fighting that he's implementing su wu choi is very outdated it's very ineffective in a lot of for a lot of different reasons his stance makes it and that's why he's so bad at takedown defense his takedown defense is terrible he gets hit a lot. He's very predictable. He's just so, so like easily beat that you don't have to draw the map. It's just to go do what you learned in basic MMA training. Remember, MMA, 
mixed martial arts where you got to mix. Look what Evolov did to him. Did you see the Evolov fight did with this guy? He Everywhere it went, anywhere it went, however it went, he was mixing it up from strikes or landing so easily and then trans level change down to the take the single leg, the double leg without a problem. It was sweeping him off his feet. He was picking him up. And then even the other opponent, Gavin Tucker, was just out muscling even when um su wong choi was getting the better positions which was very hard and very rare that you see him get a better position because he's just not he's not a good wrestler he's not a good grappler he's very he's a one trick pony but even if he does does use his eight inch reach advantage he had an eight inch reach advantage mind you over gavin tucker and he opened up as a pick em. So it was minus 115 minus 115 for whatever reasons maybe the reach advantage i don't know but coming off of a loss, they still made him a pickums against the guy who had only got one. But Gavin Tucker had just got off of his first and only loss. He was undefeated. Uh, guy, mind you, he came in with a coach, the same coach, uh, great mind, MMA mind, one of the best coaches, the same guy that coaches uh, GSP, uh, George St. Pierre. Is, and the same guy that coached is it was on his corner that night coaching him. So that advantage was another reason why I say he got the short end of the stick. You got to fight two people. You got the mind of a GSP, good IQ guy who's sharp, but then you got the physique of like a super strong Gavin Tucker's built his cardio and his physique and his strength. He's like a, you know, who he reminds you of like slightly not as good of, but uh, that new guy that uh, somebody had compared me to him actually. Uh, Joe, shoot, I'll never forget his name. Not Joe Seleski, but a little bit Joe Seleski too. Um, all right, I'll get back to it, guys. But he had fought Christian Aguilera, and he just beat Christian Aguilera on the ground. He's a new prospect that he's doing. Sean Brady. So he kind of reminds me, Gavin Tucker is very similar to like a Sean Brady. He mixes it up very well. He's very well rounded. He goes transitions, love it. There's a lot of reasons they serve. They kind of even almost look alike. But anyways, uh, so. He had his way with him very badly and he submitted him in the third round after losing a point he was still gonna win the fight even if he didn't submit him he lost the point in the second round i forgot why i don't remember what the reasons was but even after losing a point he was gonna beat this guy so basic he's on such a low, low level low level tier so like you know how you have like your i was telling you like a cheeto vera he's the best of the low level guys he'll never make it to the top five Really, he's not the one to, and everybody that he was picking, they were picking him against uh, to win. I told you that there's levels to this and that he looks good against the lower level guys or even the mid level guys because he's one of the best of the low levels. Well, this guy is nowhere near the best of the low levels. If you put him in the category of low level guys, he's the low of the lows. He's almost at the level of a fade. He's just a little bit better than a fade. But he's he's very close to it. Why he's a favorite, I'll explain. Forget the reasons why, but uh, let's just the rightful favorite here is the guy with the better record, better stamina, better IQ. He does that thing I told you that Dustin Poirier does. He lets off the gas, and then in the later rounds when it matters the most, you see him at 150 percent. It really messes with their psychology. It messes. It gives you an advantage in the scorecards. It keeps you more fresh. And when they're vulnerable and they're weaker and subject and more easier to submit and damage and they're vulnerable, you start to be at your best and they look better and better. That this guy's great cardio is a, a perfect combination with his good IQ, his good wrestling. He's got good defense. Unlike Wu Choi, who's very stationary, he's very stiff. Uh, he has great head movement. He's got great fluidity and just. He's sweet. He does the switch stance so good and so often. Like you have a lot of people who do switch stances very well, like the Rafael Fazil's Fazef that we told you was gonna beat Roy Cano, most Moicano, Renato Moicano, whatever. Because of using that, it was gonna. Play. This guy does it even better, and he does it more often. He's very underrated. He's not getting the respect he deserves. This is a card. Remember, I told you each card has a theme. We a lot of them tell it. Uh, they scream value or underdogs or future contenders. This one is underrated. Another example, Benil Darush. 
he holds a win over his opponent, Diego Ferreira. They, they've already fought. He didn't just beat him. He annihilated him. It was like 10-8 rounds almost. He was the guy who outlanded him in total strikes, 90 to 30, more than tripled him. And since then, thanks to the great minds of like Rafael Cordero and training partners like Martin Vittori and under the same management as uh, Kamzat Chemaev and Fabricio Werdum, he trains with the best of the best people and he's looking better than ever. That's why he's got a six, he's on like a five or six fight win streak all by first round finishes. Two of them were like highlight reels. Jakar Close was one of the best comeback knockouts I've seen ever. And the spinning back elbow to Scott Holtzman in the first round. And he's an underdog against the guy he's already beat. What is going on over here? And then you guys, you're, you guys got a guy who, who shouldn't even be in the UFC. The guy's only got a win over a guy like Ibrimov. Ibrimov. Uh, Anyways, uh, what's his name? Marquez, uh, I gotta do these names. So, uh, let me fix this. Oh man, all right, until I get the names. Yeah, so uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna pick the underdog to beat Sung Woo Choi. That's my underdog play for the day. And, um, Another fade, okay? This guy, I, he's got to join the fade list. If he, He's the Jordan Wright of this card. You know how I told you guys Jordan Wright, who had like an undefeated fluffy record? I said it was fluffy because not only that it was padded and all of the guys he's beat have never had a win in their lives. He's only beat guys who have never beat anybody. And the only people that he does have wins over that have wins themselves are against people who don't have wins themselves. So it's really like you got to go deeper, further into the records to realize that they're very padded. They're not just padded, they're very padded. And that same thing applies to Danilo Marquez. Very padded and you can see the confidence the same way as it when somebody needs to use steroids to feel good about themselves, the Carlos Pineda or Daniel Pineda's, I mean, uh, is another. Oh yeah, that's another thing, by the way, Chris Gutierrez. One of the guys I'm very high on is one of, he trains out of uh, Factor X, um, is one of the gyms that Colin works out of. He's got some of the best trainers and training partners who can mimic very well the style of, uh, Wu, Wu uses his, he's very long for the division, so he likes to use his length to do kicks and stuff like that. And who better than a Chris Gutierrez that's his main training partner out of Denver, they train together uh, on a daily basis. And he's got the help of guys like James Cross, uh, Josh Parisian. So he's got a lot of guys who can mimic, you know, from the size alone. That is, plays a big uh, factor. And this guy just, he, he makes black belts kind of look bad sometimes. He's just very, very well-rounded. He's got a lot of heart, fighting heart, spirit. So I don't know why he's the underdog, and, and, and but I'll take advantage of it. At minus, or I'm sorry, plus 145. You guys better, I would do what I do with Ben Neal. I would lock it in now and then lock it in again later. So if it keeps going. All right, um, so what else? Colin uh, Anglin, um, yeah, he mixes as well. He's got good IQ, good cardio. He's got uh, precision. He's very technical. He's got. He's going to be the way more powerful. Just off of power, he'll be able to get the better positioning. Like I was saying, Gavin Tucker was winning positioning over uh, Wu Choi just because of the strength discrepancy. Like he was in the bad positions and uh, losing positioning, but then he would win it back. Not even by technique. He was just by outpowering him and getting out of the positions and bad situation just by outpowering him and then when he did put him in a rear naked choke in the third round it wasn't even on that well and it wasn't even on for that long but the power he couldn't fight the hands he was just so much weaker and that's another thing that's going to be a, an effect here Wu Choi is just too weak to be able to fight and win against a guy like he can't hurt him he's not going to be He's not like some crazy like Israel Adesanya fluid like John Jones like spinning and like he doesn't do nothing like that crazy so he's not going to land anything that's unpredictable so uh, I don't know why his reflexes 
especially Collins are very well. He moves like really, really fluid. All right, so Danilo Marquez back on track. A fade of mine's uh, slow Mike. You know what it is? The marketing machine, they owe him a favor, man. They screwed him bad against Ed Herman. He was winning and he was on a good streak. He had a good record. The momentum he was coming off. It was an important fight to keep him going. And the even Dana White, after the fight was over, told him, look, man, I'm sorry. They screwed you. I gotta, I'll gotta. make it up. He's trying to overturn. They, they did everything to help him fix it, but it was too late. He lost the fight to Ed Herman that he should have won. Go back and you can see how they screwed him, the judges. It was, it was just a mistake that had nothing. He, he had to pay for somebody else's mistake, and he paid for it with the, losing the fight. That's a big price to pay, right? So what, they, what does the UFC do to make it up to them? I tell you, they got power, man. I told you that they were going to do this. The UFC is the reason why Neil Magny, I told you he was gonna, he should have won the fight, but they gave him a worse style matchup than um, even Cosma because they he called their bluff. He made them look bad when when they were saying nobody wants to take a fight against our big bad wolf. Kamzat Shemaev is a, a beast. Nobody's trying to fight with him. Nobody wants to take the fight. And then he kept saying, well, I do, I do, I do. And you guys are not letting me. So he made them look bad at the cost of, you know, that he, they gave him, to, to make himself look good, he made them look, he, he threw them under the bus, and they made him pay for it. I told you that in the buildup. I said that they couldn't have given him a worse style matchup uh, for the way he fights, his techniques, and the holes that I saw in his game that they would have picked up as well in the Lawler fight. In the Lawler fight, it was a confirmation of everything I ever thought about Magny. Magny is not that guy that you guys think he is, and I told you guys the reasons why, and I gave you a long explanation about the reasons why he would lose. Well, if I knew it, I'm sure UFC's matchmakers and the, you know, Sh Sean Shelby's and their, uh, those guys, they know what they're doing. So they gave out of punishment. I told you it was a punishment. They, they gave him a guy who everybody thinks he should beat, but you know, he's gotten less followers. So he, he doesn't got the Kazmat. So you wanted Kamza? I'll tell you what. We'll give you somebody with less followers so you don't have anything to gain from beating him. If he beats you, it's bad. If you beat him, it's not that impressive. It's not that you should have. You're the favorite. They made him a favorite because for you know the popular, a lot of reasons why, the same reason why Darush is not the favorite or why Wu Choi is not, he is the favorite. So odd makers, they don't, that's why I tell you guys, sometimes the best parlay pieces are not the ones that they tell you are the bigger favorites because that's you they they go off of all the wrong things man that's they full handicappers handicappers if 99 percent of the handicappers that i know about they make their decisions based off of value so you think it's a coincidence that the values are all messed up now you don't think that these bookies have come to terms and are aware of the strategy that the odd make i mean that the uh that the handicappers are using for their clients. This is a big business, guys. This is not a thousand dollar business, a million dollars. This is a multi-billion dollar industry we're talking about. They're on top of it, man. They're one step ahead of the handicappers, but I'm one step ahead of them. So don't worry. You you just sit back, look pretty, cash in my tickets if you're in the Patreon. So if you're not in the Patreon, what are you waiting for, guys? All right, uh, back on track. Um, so yeah, my single bets list, if you just did my first five, imagine if you did all 10 of them. If you did all 10 of them, nine out of 10 of them hit, and like eight out of 10 of them were plus money. So I always find you ways, like the Chanel by decision, not only was he in the underdog, but the by decision prop was like plus 500. So that's why I said, even if my ratio was 50% right, which I'm way better than that, you guys know that. I get almost, I get more days of 100% right than I've ever had 50%, right? I've never had a 50% low accuracy like that. Not even on my worst day. So, but even if I did, with the pluses that I get my tickets at, I would still be in the profit. So imagine what I'm at now that I get this type of accuracy. All right, guys. Uh, next fight. Oh, yeah. So Dilla, Danilo Marquez is going against a guy who UFC is trying to make look good because they owe it to him. So keep that in mind. Remember, I always ask, I, I tell you always before, this is another thing that goes into my bet slips. You guys don't, you have jobs, you have families, you don't have the time to think about all the politics and then do the research. You know how much this stuff goes into making these bet slips and having my accuracy go into it 
to make just the perfect storm, the combination of what I need to have and do. Some stuff that I do, I told you in the beginning of the episode, you can't teach it. You don't have that uh, lesson in a book somewhere I can just re- tell, tell you to read this and now you can do it the way I can do it. No, I, I lived this life. I trained 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And the best gyms in the world, the Windy City Boxing Club, the biggest, best names came out of there. I was the owner. I might as well have, I didn't really own it, but you might as well have made me the owner. I had the keys to the place. I opened the doors and I closed them six days a week. And on the seventh day when the doors were not open, I was still doing my stuff at home. I never stopped training. I lived this life full time. It was the moment I lived, I ate, I breathed the sport. And then I happen to follow it too. And then the best part is the betting aspect behind it, which has nothing to do with being a fan. If you could, you could be the biggest fan in the world and have no idea how to make money using it. I happen to be the best at it because by trial and error, I develop a system that made Umar and Norma Magedov my worst value piece and Chanel and Chiesa my best value. So what does that tell you? Who else could have made that? They would have done the opposite for everybody else. Matt Schnell, if he was, he was not even on their list, first of all. But if he wasn't going to be on their list, because everybody picked Tyson Nam to win, go look at all the other channels that uh, Cody's, that everybody else picked Schnell by knockout. Uh, that Dogger Pass show, uh, DFA, everybody picked Tyson Nam to win and by knockout, right? So uh, even if by some miracle they got the right pick, they wouldn't have put him as number one. They would have put him as like number nine or ten, and guys like Umar and Koski that they got wrong would have been number one, right? So they don't, they're so far from being able to do this that they haven't even started yet. You gotta first master the system of getting the right picks, and that's gotta be something you can't teach. Then you gotta figure out how to develop a system where it's the maximum profits, the minimal. Do you know on that Chanel fight, we did three bets that we're gonna hedge in case Chanel lost? We were still going to make some money by hedge. I made it. Remember I told you on the specials that hedging where all of them hit. Well, all three bets cashed in. We didn't lose any over rounds cashed in Chanel by decision cashed in and Chanel money line cashed in. The over was just in case uh, Chanel lost, but it went to decisions. And at least if he didn't get knocked down, because I told you he's motivated. He's got a baby on the way, his first baby, and he's coming off of a knockout loss, a layover. Like, there's a lot of reasons why I knew he wasn't going to be that hot-headed guy who wasn't disciplined. Look at my first episode. The first time I talked, I said that he's going to be disciplined. He's not going to be getting into unnecessary exchanges. He's going to be the more fluid, better mover, and he's going to be cutting angles in and out. He's not going to do what got him in trouble in that fight where he lost against a different style of fighter, a guy who's more fluid and not this, not a Tyson Nam guy who just relies on his strength, powers, and down the straight pipe type of a, a striker who's not really very fluid. But, you know, it was just for many reasons I knew he wasn't. I told you guys if he st- spent a million rounds, seven days a week, you put him in a five-round fight with Tyson Nam, that version of Tyson Nam and that version of Danger Schnell, same result every single time. That's why it was a. It should have been a 30-27 unanimous decision win, but for some reason, uh, one one judge messed that up. It must have been Chris Lee or something. All right, who else are we gonna talk about, guys? Uh, so the rest. Of, this is a one two part segment. The second part is private. That's another benefit of the Patreon. The rest of the picks they're going into a private uh, section for the patrons. Each fighter, each fight has their own folder. You'll get short segments. That's another thing I'm including us every fight. If you just want to bet on a specific fight, let's say Darush versus Rare, you can go to a folder for just that fight. It'll, it'll have video of it, of the my breakdown, my my prediction, and it'll have actual posts of like statistics, my opinions. So you'll get both videos and detailed prescri- descriptions, pictures, stats, and my opinion all on video and in posts, numerous posts on both fighters, advantages and disadvantages, physical, mental, everything that it goes. Every fighter will have their own column. We got fades of the week column. We got 
underrated, overvalued, overrated underdogs. You can sort them out very easy. There's hundreds of different folders. You can throw, skim through it. Entertainment, breaking news. So even if you're just there for fun, if you want to just get, you're on your lunch break at work and you want to go skim through the MMA news or entertainment, like the knockouts, the best top 10 knockouts, the top 10 submissions, Stuff like that you can go is designed to for people that just want that kind of stuff as well. So you get the best of both worlds, entertainment and money making opportunities. All right, guys. Uh, so I gave you more than you deserve. Hit the like. I'm just kidding. But please, if you do, if you do want me to continue this, you gotta make a comment. Don't just hit the like. Hit the reminders. Subscribe if you haven't. Please subscribe if you haven't, because that's the only way I can keep coming back. If you need the free contact, you want the free picks. If you get up to 60 likes, if I get 60 likes on this video, I'll give you another a sneaky. Remember my last sneaky prop bet was Condit by Decision. Everybody else thought it was going to be inside the distance. They all faded uh, Matt Brown's chin. I told you for many, I gave you a look at the comments. It was timestamp. I even put a pin. A two, it was like three paragraphs on why it was going to be a decision prop. So that was because you guys hit 60 likes. It was plus 300, 270. 275 uh, prop bet cashed in. So I'll give you another sneaky prop bet, an underdog. If you can hit 60 likes, hit a bunch of comments, hit the like, and I'll keep coming back. Let me see, maybe uh, since you this was a longer video, I'm gonna give you an extra treat. I'll give you a parlay, because we didn't get to do it. So you, uh, usually my segments will be underdog, parlay piece, a fade, a prop bet, and some MMA topics, like hot uh, topics and news, and then a betting tip. And I may even throw, since I'm the fighting guru, a quick fighting tip. Like if I was a trainer, back, still a trainer back in my heydays, and I was teaching you something, I'll throw in a, maybe a fighting tip. All right, guys, but uh, for now, we don't have time for all that, guys. Uh, that'll be a maybe a thing I'll add in a Patreon, some lessons. If you guys want to document, I'll put a, a couple of, things for the patrons on how to do that but we have open lines of communication just let me remind you if you ever have questions if you're in the patron like somebody i posted right before the fights they asked me how do i feel about the juliana pena over rounds because you know everybody likes to get the over rounds on women's mma he gave me a long list of or the chiesa fight they asked me personal questions one-on-one -on -one, and i get to them right away so i told them juliana pena and her opponent will both be looking for submissions from the beginning to the end. They're both going to try to submit each other. So the over rounds would have been a bad idea. He stopped himself from adding that onto his parlay. And I'm glad because Juliana Pana, which was one of my underdog picks, if you look on January 6th, I made a list. Look, my accuracy on a list of just underdogs is better than most people's regular accuracy. I made a list on January 6th. And it's on my Twitter. If you look at my Twitter, it's on my Patreon and my Twitter. Timestamp for January 6th. I had The Leech. I had uh, Matt Schnell. I had... Anyways, I, there's about seven people who... Uh, out of nine. I got seven out of nine right. Out of underdogs. So I was batting seven out of nine correct. So the other one that I got wrong was a split decision loss. So he, one of the judges gave it to him. So if you counted that one, that would be eight out of nine of my underdogs I posted. And th that was a mixture between all the different events. Like on January 6th, I put like four or five events that were upcoming together. I picked my favorite one. It had the leech on there. It had, uh, at the time she was an underdog, Juliana Pena. So many. The list is still there. There's nine of them that fought already and seven of them cashed in for us. One of them was a split decision. I can't remember who the ninth one was. All right, guys. Uh, so I'll give you one more tip or let me see what I can give you. Um, I'll give you, oh yeah, uh, a main event pick. Overeem versus Volkov. Let me tell you why Volkov should be a bigger favorite. Volkov is the kind of a guy, he's got so much, he's such a great fighter, well-rounded, and he's very durable, he's very, if he wants, he's the kind of, here's the guy that 
has so much potential and he only fights to the level of it. This guy, if you don't push him, he will not fight as good as he could. If you've given him some adversity, if you push him to a corner, you'll see a version of him that's way more dangerous and high level and effective and good than the one that if you were just coasting and you were not trying to put your opponent in any danger, if you're just trying to win off a point. Well, the good thing is Overeem is not that guy. He's the guy who's going to push forward and make him force him to bring that guy out of him that he has very many times shown us is just super crazy high level, strong. His kicks like, you remember that kick against, how long ago was it? Let me see. Uh, I made a lot of money because I, I, I put inside the distance uh, on this fight. Everybody thought it was going to, because it was a perfect hedge that even if he had lost, which I didn't think was going to happen, but I knew he, it was, he was going to win inside the distance. So I, Put, I remember putting the inside the distance on this one. Uh, I want to know the date on that fight. How long ago was that? Because I, I feel like it was recently, but I know it wasn't. Um, all right, Drago fought against the, if I'm not mistaken, Black Beast, was it? Hold on. Uh, yeah, that's what Curtis Blade. I always get them confused. Curtis Blade, who's fighting the Black Priest, that's why. All right, Curtis Blade uh, beat him, actually. I'm sorry, that, that's not the fight. I was talking, uh, who did he stop? Oh, yeah, it was the Black Beast, Derek Lewis. So uh, Derek Lewis uh, got kicked in the stomach, if I'm not mistaken, right? And that, that's what started it. It was a kick to the stomach. If something had opened, and he, hurt, he hurt him real bad. And it was because Derek Lewis is similar to an all-star over him. He's going to push you. He's going to force you to have to put him away, which is what, like, for example, Rosenstruck had to do. He was losing the fight until he won the fight, right? Well, this is a guy who, at this level of his career, where he is, he's only 32 years young, guys. He's my age. We're the same age. 33, actually. I'm a little older than him. Uh, so uh, this guy is at a level of his career. He's in his prime, 21 of his 32 wins. So like it, one of the edges, one of the ex factors that plays a big role, like how he beat Walt Harris, for example, and so many others is his experience. The guy's ring generalship, his ring IQ is so far beyond most people's. This guy's got so many victories. Been this, he's like an Israel Adesanya. He's got the kickboxing background. He's got a bunch of accolades in there, but this guy matches his. He's got 32 wins, eight losses, four out of 40 fights. Uh, 21 of his fights have been by knockout, three of them by submission. So 24 finishes alone. Just fit. most people don't even have 24 fights. He's got 24 finishes. Alexander, did you, I call him Drago from like uh. The, uh, the guy from Rocky, the movies, the Russian guy. I uh, forgot his real name. But yeah, this Russian guy is really good, man. The, this uh, Volkov guy, I'm very high on it. I think he's very underrated. Like I said, the theme of this uh, thing, he should be a bigger favorite because the style matchup is perfect. Anybody else like who's the sneaky type who starts slow and then like... Lit that guy might worry me more, but a guy like Overeem, who's going to have his foot on the pedal the whole time, is perfect. That's the kind of guy I, I would love to see Volkov fight against because that's when he lets loose and he let and he brings his skills out. And he does have very many of them. He's very well-rounded. Everywhere it goes, he's just got very good skills. Let's see what his takedown... Uh, see, one of the things people, uh, people would have to worry about is... Uh, Overeem, his, he gets on you like a wet blanket. This guy's game, takedown defense, is not just good. But here's the thing about love about this one. The style, I can see this is where I played the fights in my head before it happens. I can see Volkov not just stuffing a takedown attempt if Overeem gets desperate and starts to get chewed apart because he doesn't like getting hit. Overeem gets very desperate when it comes to when he starts getting punished on the feet when he gets the bad end of the exchanges he gets sloppy and desperate and he could get knocked 
clean out. I could see that happening here with like a kick or an elbow or a spinning like a forearm, something crazy. I could see that happening here because, uh, let me show you, hold on. Don't worry, these will have timestamps, guys. Sorry for the duration of this. Uh, and remember, check out my interview yesterday. I did an interview with UFC's star, uh, Miranda Maverick. You guys would love to hear more about what she has to say. I guarantee you guys. Um, uh, sorry, it's real late where I'm at right now. I'm on European time. Anyways, here, let's do this. Alexander Volkov. Uh, yeah, this will be a shortcut. Alright. Okay. So, out of, remind, let me remind you, he's got several. One, two, three, four, five, six. He's got like eight fights inside uh, UFC in just the last, uh, let's see, three, four years, I guess. Yeah, anyways, um, maybe more. Uh, but his take, mind you, he's 6'7", guys. 6'7", he's got an 80-inch reach. 80-inch reach, guys. 6'7". He could have been a, a center, a basketball player. All right. Uh, okay, now look how great this guy is. He lands significant strikes about five per minute, only absorbs two. A guy of this size only absorbs two. You know how much that means? A guy of this weight, at this level, at this division, I mean, they are not very fluid. They're not very, like, uh, good at avoiding. They're usually just durable. They can block or they can just absorb it very well and give back and trade. He doesn't need to, man. If this guy, like I said, if you push him to fight the way he could fight at his full of, Capacity abilities. This guy is a freaking world beater, a champion level type of fighter, man. And look, his takedown uh, defense. Mind you, this is on the highest platform, the highest. This guy's fought who's he? Curtis Blade. Who goes through a fight with Curtis? Do you know what takedown defense looks like for a guy like who did Curtis Blade fight recently? I forgot. Uh, Wall. Hold on. Where they're do you like they're uh who was it? I think Derek Lewis I think I don't know not Derek Lewis um he fought somebody that he took him down um oh yeah that Shamil guy and Justin Willis Justin Willis I think is who I was thinking about or Mark Hunt for example Mark Hunt he did this to him like ten times he probably messed up Mark's hunt he probably went from like six percent to 20 percent after you're a fight with he's like a marab of the division he doesn't stop trying to take you down curtis blades you know he's a chain wrestler he's a khabib of the division he, he's not stop taking you down well after fighting with guys like that guys like fabricio Werdum, who he landed two takedowns on by the way he landed on Verdum two takedowns successfully so he's got 70% range. He's in a 70% range of takedown defense and accuracy, both. Super high level, man. Everywhere it goes, no matter where it goes, he's got a great style. His defense is amazing. His absorption rate is low. His landing is high. His reach advantage is amazing. Now, if we go to Alistar Overeem, for example, He's got it. I don't know if he's got the same. I mean, they say on paper he does, but that stuff is not. You're like Anthony Smith, for example, is a perfect example. He, yeah, on paper, it says he's like 6'6, six, six, and like, but he's really like 6'3. So there's a lot of these things that, and I see it a lot in women's MMA, especially. They're, they're not real numbers. All right, but look at this guy. Alvarim's same amount of fights, same amount of period, about, and he's absorbing as much as he's landing and he so he lands about three which is way less than five and he absorbs around 2.6 2.7 so it's an even amount like i said that most people do around this division is they give as much as they take and they hope to just uh, be the longer one that can last and so uh, he's different man i'm telling you they got the same defense and uh takedowns 
but the accuracy is better. Volkov has the better accuracy by far in takedown. So like I said, he'll be better there as well. Wherever it goes, he's way better. And the matchup is perfect style. I really couldn't have thought of a better style for him and a better type of a opponent that would bring out the the certain level uh, that he can operate at so this is like again more reason I, I for a lot of reasons i'll get into it in the patreon longer detailed explanation personal breakdowns for each fight you'll see a column a folder separate for every fight you can do it or there'll be one that just gives them all together if you don't want to have to go through them separate you can get a video that just all of it at the same time so if you're playing it at home or at work you don't want to keep pressing something that makes it more convenient all right please hit the like hit the reminders the subscribe tell your friends look if we hit a certain amount if you could tell your wives your i'll do another bonus okay if we reach a certain amount of subscriptions if you tell your friends your wife anybody who likes mma who can follow my channel uh, and you just put it in the notes like you did it, I'll put an, a great parlay, a guaranteed to cash in parlay at big plus odds. Like the one of the ones that I cashed in at 12 to 1. Uh, I've never done this. I've never offered. But if we can get, if I notice a fluctuate, there's no specific number. But if I see a good number of within the next three, two or three business days, all right? If I see enough comments and likes and subscribers, I'm going to put a big money-making tip. Not just a parlay, but it's something juicy, like a sneaky profit for you guys in the comment section. So that patrons, everybody benefits from it. But And it'll give you an idea of what the patrons get on a regular basis. But they're getting 14 out of 14 of the fights. Every fight we find a profit. Or more than one, if, like you've seen. All right, thank you guys. I appreciate you joining me. And if it wasn't so late, I'd go another two hours. I love talking to MMA. I love talking to you guys. Uh, but uh, we got more stuff coming ahead of us, so don't worry. Uh, look forward to some upgrades and changes being made with you guys. We hit a big milestone. Thank you for my 100 patrons. Uh, I'm blessed to have you guys. And now you can expect the content, the accuracy, the bet slips especially, to be the best they've ever been. Thank you guys for your support. See you soon. Fighting Guru out.